Well, good official afternoon. If you're in the east on the eastern seaboard, if you're further out west, it's still a good morning. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, welcome to another Takeo Tuesday. I'm John Barba, and joining me is Dave Holdorf. We're both from Takeo Comfort Solutions. And uh, today's discussion is going to be on uh, efficiency standards for residential circulators. And we're not talking about DOE mandates. We're talking about labeling that you're going to start seeing, if you haven't already, on residential circulators, both on the circulator itself and on the box. And we're going to discuss where those come from, what those mean, uh, and how you can use them to demonstrate the uh, the uh, uh, um, viability or the desirability of upgraded upgrades to your circulators. Uh, if you're going to replace a circulator, do you use a standard efficiency model, which is less expensive if you're outside of a rebate state, or do you go with a high efficiency ECM model? And what's the point? Uh, so we're going to talk about all that, how to use the math, where the math comes from, who did the math. It wasn't us. Okay, this was an independent. Uh, this is an independent uh, organization that has studied the efficiency of all the residential circulators uh, out there, and they graded them or rated them in terms of of which ones are the most efficient. So some of those results may surprise you. A um, couple things before we get started, uh, just. As, as always, uh, this is being recorded. You will get a copy of the recording tomorrow uh, uh, in an email along with a little certificate that you can download, a certificate of attendance. But uh, we always recommend that you treat this like, uh, like a classroom. That means you know, grab yourself a pen, grab yourself a pad of paper, and take some notes as you go along. It's, a, it's really the best way to stay focused. Otherwise, the mind tends to wander. You might find yourself cruising over to Facebook or email or whatever. You know, so those are those are things you want to try to avoid. The best way to to um, make sure you stay focused is to take notes and treat it like a classroom. You won't miss anything that way. Uh, trust us. Uh, the other thing I'd like you to do is on your control panel, please go down to the uh, chat and question section and just type in something that lets us know that you can hear us and that you know how to ask questions. So hi, hello, how are you? Whatever, just type that in if you would for us, please. And that way we know you can hear us. And folks, that's going to be how you ask questions. And I see it's just, this is just lit up. That's terrific. Excellent. Uh, but this is how you're going to ask questions. So type in your questions as they occur to you. We encourage you guys to ask questions because if it's just me and Dave talking, and eh, this gets kind of dull, right? We're not terribly engaging people on our own. We need your <laughs> we need your input. We need your help. Uh, we'll stop every couple of slides, every few slides to address any questions that may have popped up. We're happy to do that. Um, uh, and we'll stay on as long as you guys have questions at the end. We're also happy to do that as well. So without any further ado, let's get Takeo Tuesday on the road here. Let's get started, and we're going to talk about efficiency ratings for residential circulators. Efficiency ratings for residential circulators. Now, you've all seen these stickers on appliances, right? This is the Energy Guide, uh, Energy Guide sticker. It's on virtually all appliances. And what it does is it gives you an estimated yearly energy cost, right? You see them on water heaters, boilers, air conditioners, refrigerators, you name it. It's on everything out there. And it tells, it gives you an idea so you can compare different models, different types of, of appliances, and see which ones are the most energy efficient. Generally speaking, more energy efficiency leads is, you know, is gives you a higher upfront cost, lower energy efficiency, a lower upfront cost, and you have to make a decision based on what you're looking for. So again, it's estimated annual cost. Now these come from the Federal Trade Commission. All right, these are all mandated by the Federal Trade Commission. Federal Trade Commission is not involved in the circulator ratings, however, that they've got nothing to do with that. Uh, what we have comes from the Hydraulic Institute, and it's it's similar but different. It doesn't put a dollar figure on it. It gives you an energy rating range for variable speed circulators, uh, from its most consumptive to its least consumptive operating range. All right, what you're looking at here is a sticker that comes with the Takeo VT2218. And you'll see that the, the energy rating range is 138 to 188. So when it's working in its most efficient mode, all right, in its delta T, this is a, our delta T pump. When it's working in its delta T mode, its energy rating is 188. When it's working as a fixed speed pump running at full speed, which it can do, its energy efficiency rating is 138, which would be less. With energy ratings, the higher, the better, the higher, the better. And again, this comes from the Hydraulic Institute. The Hydraulic Institute 
And uh, you'll see them coming out this summer. We're trying to, the goal for the Hydraulic Institute is to drive market conversion, to help spur along the conversion from standard efficiency, permanent split capacitor residential circulators to the higher efficiency ECM circulators. Now in areas where we have uh, utility rebates that are that uh, the, the tradesman can, can get that rebate at the counter when he buys the circulator, there's no need to, to push this, this conversation. That's in, in, in certain states and in certain areas. Other parts of the country where there are no energy rebates or incentives, well, now we have to, we have to demonstrate the value uh, as an industry. And that's what the Hydraulic Institute is doing, is they're giving, uh, they're giving us, meaning the industry, a, a means by which we can compare circulators with one another and energy efficient circulators versus standard efficiency circulators. And this labeling system covers all circulators under one horsepower. Uh, January 2020, the Department of Energy had mandates for circulators above one horsepower, and those have been in effect since then, and, and they, they mandate all commercial level uh, grade pumps and circulators. This is a voluntary program covering circulators below one horsepower, the more residential side. So a real quick uh, look, look, see at the Hydraulic Institute. What is the Hydraulic Institute? Well, it's the global authority on pumps and they've been creating pump standards as the logo says, creating pump standards since 1917. It's an industry organization and all of the manufacturers of pumps are members of this organization. And what the organization does is it is independent. We're members, but it is independent. Uh, it develops standards for design, operation, testing, et cetera. And it works with the Department of Energy to develop regulations that are fair to all to all concerned, both the, the industry itself and to the users of, of pumps and circulators. So it's a it's a it it's a it's a it's an industry standard that sets it's an industry organization that sets the standards for the industry, develops standards for all of the design, operation, testing, et cetera. So again, it's, and it's independently run. We're all members of it. All the manufacturers are members of it, but it is an independent organization. They get into testing and rulemaking, as we mentioned. Uh, the DOE would make a rule. The DOE says, hey, this is what we have to do. We need to meet these standards, blah, de, blah, de, blah. Um, what the Hydraulic Institute does is the Hydraulic Institute puts it all in motion. It develops testing standards that uh, that you know to, so we can test to what the doe says we have to do and it also approves testing labs and it creates the procedures including machinery calibration personnel training etc and then it'll it'll review all of these test results so there's no way you know it's it's not one of these things where a a, a company can say here's our test results accept them the test results are are you know they, to be an approved testing lab you have to meet certain standards and you are audited it's not this can it's not this situation where the home team always wins all right there are independent labs and you can become as a manufacturer you can become an approved testing lab which Taco has done but again it's not the home team always wins these tests these test results are legit and they are all, they are independently audited so energy ratings, what's the point behind these energy ratings? As again, it's independent third party. It's not any manufacturer say so, okay? It's not Takeo saying our pumps are the best. It's not Grunfoss saying our pumps are the best, or it's not B&G saying our pumps are the best. These are independent third party ratings of circulator operation and technology. Um, the hope is by the Hydraulics Institute that the utilities will use these rankings or these ratings to determine uh, appropriate incentive levels and rebates. So to incentivize the most efficient offerings, if, if they can, if they decide to go that, to go that route. For the trade, the goal here is to demonstrate savings over quote unquote standard circulators. So if anybody ever says to you, well, what's my payback if I go with that ECM circulator? First off, Payback's a nonsensical discussion. It's not payback. The only thing this, the only way this thing's ever going to pay you back is if it gets a job, okay? And and you garnish its wages. It doesn't work that way. the the real The real term you're looking for is offset. At what point will the reduced energy consumption of the uh, higher efficiency option offset whatever increased purchase price I needed to to pay? 
to get this thing. Okay, that's that. When people say payback, they really mean offset or return on investment. It's not an investment; it's a circulator. If you don't have one, your heating system doesn't work, right? So it's not an investment, and there's no payback or ROI. It's simply at what point does does what I not what I'm not spending on electricity to run this pump offset the purchase the increased purchase price? How long does that take? The math allows you to demonstrate that. And again, the math is independent based on third-party ratings. There's no, there's no hinkering of the, uh, of, the, of the math here, okay? And it doesn't give you an indication of, of who and what will be off, who, who will be offering you the best overall technology when it, comes, when it comes to circulators. So with that said, let us continue. All right, just checking to see if there are any questions yet, and none as of yet, so we can keep on rolling. So here's the point. The point is pretty straightforward. And this is a direct quote from the Hydraulic Institute. Circulator energy rating labels are only applied to the most efficient circulator pumps on the market. Rated circulators save energy, maximize overall system efficiency, cut operation costs, and reduce carbon emissions. I'd say that pretty much says it all right there. That's the point of, of the energy rating labels and the whole program. Uh, the whole program. Um, You'll also note these are only the labels are only on ECM pumps. You will not see them on standard efficiency circulators. They'll only be on ECM offerings, only on ECM offerings. So what are these labels? This is the, a, a picture of a label that you will see on a circulator, okay? Uh, and it's going to be on the circulator, and you'll also have a, a larger version of this on the box of the circulator. And it just gives you some information. First off, that that energy rating, in this example, 150 to 180, that is a comparison uh, of that circulator to what the Hydraulic Institute considers a baseline pump. That means the baseline pump is the least efficient circulator on the market in that particular category. They've identified the least efficient circulator in that category. And what we're doing is simply comparing the high efficiency model to that one. All right. So that's the important thing to remember. Uh, the energy rating itself is a percentage of the power savings over that particular circulator, over that baseline circulator. Now, you'll notice there's a couple of other numbers up here. There's the circulator energy index or CEI, and that's a decimal 0.60. And then in parentheses right after is ER 180. Uh, again, it compares consumption. It's a decimal point. It's two ways of saying the same thing, really. 0.60, the lower the number, the better. ER 180, the higher the number, the better. But it's two sides of the same coin. It is, in fact, simpler and easier to deal with the energy rating itself than to, to, to bring the CEI into it. There's a lot of complicated math on how they get to that. But uh, the energy rating is simple. It's straightforward. The higher the number, the better the circulator. All right. So here's the look, this is the label that would be on the box. And so you, as you can see, it's a little bit more detailed. There's a lot more information. You've got your brand information, which will tell you, you know, the pump brand, the model number, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's this thing in the upper right-hand corner, if you can see it up there, called WAIP, W-A-I-P, which is not a radio station, no. It, it stands for Weighted Average Input Power. Weighted Average Input Power of that circulator at full speed, with no controls taken into account, all right? So it's full speed, fixed speed, and it's it's a horsepower rating, okay? One of the things we have to do in our math is convert horsepower to watts, and, and you'll see how that works, all right? So that's what WAPE is, weighted average input power at full speed, no controls, all right? Um, then you got CEI and ER, two ways of saying the same thing. Focus on ER because that's the, the functional number, and then we start talking about controls, all right? Down, down here underneath the box, it says, note, the ER value is dependent upon the selected control. Multiple options may be available on this pump as follows. And this, of course, again, is the VT2218. And we have two, op two uh, control options here. One is full speed and one is temperature. It's a delta T pump. It'll vary its speed to maintain a specific delta T within the system. So uh, you could either run it at full speed, fixed speed if you chose to, that's its most consumptive mode, or if it's in the delta T mode, that's the least consumptive mode. So we're kind of, we, we bought back and forth in that range. And then lastly, we have the math 
that you can use to uh, to help you estimate the savings over uh, a, over the uh, over the baseline pump. And we're going to walk through that here right now. But it's going to give you the math to uh, to to compare what it would cost you annually to run this circulator compared to the baseline. And then we're going to show you. Well, the baseline's the least efficient model in that in that in that category, but is it the industry standard? No, the industry standard's a little different. We're going to show you the math there as well. So let's take a look. Here's how you would use this information. Okay. First off, let's compare the Taco 0015 E3. Taco 0015 E3 is our three setting variable speed uh, ECM circulator works on delta p all right it's a delta p pump constant pressure for zone valve applications or or it could be full speed uh, so that's why you have that range of 152 to 188 and 188 right now i got to tell you 188 is the highest number that the hydraulic institute has right now uh, there are a handful of circulators at 188 and we'll show you we'll show you all of the ones at 188 in just a second okay so we want to compare that to say a standard three speed circulator so or, or just a, let's say the least consumptive, or the, I'm sorry, the least efficient circulator. So let's do the least efficient circulator in the game. So what we have here is, is this is how we use the math. The first thing we do is we multiply the rating by the weight, weighted average input power, and then multiply that by 7.46. What both of those will do is that will help you convert energy rating into horsepower into watts. Okay, we're going to convert from energy rating to horsepower to watts. So 0 0.188 times 0 0.071 times 0 0.746 will tell you that at an, in, its, in its least consumptive mode, this is a 99.57 watt circulator, 99.57 watts. All right. Um, by comparison, now this is a, not, not, not that it's a 99.57 watt circulator, it's we're starting to, we're, we're comparing this in terms of savings, comparing it to the standard, the, 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 the least consult or the least efficient model. To turn watts into kilowatts, 99.57 divided by a thousand, that's going to give us 0 0.099 kilowatts. And then we multiply that by our approximate number of run hours. Now there are formulas, there's, there are maps and things that you can look at. In most of the cold weather parts of the US, uh, the Gas Appliance Manufacturers Association has estimated that you know your, your mechanical systems, your mechanical products are gonna run about 2,500 hours in the, over the course of a normal heating season. All right, for most of the cold weather part of the US, we're gonna, we're gonna identify that as the beginning of October through the end of April. So we say based on on hours, off hours, on hours, off, it's about 2,500 hours is a good average number to use. If you're more comfortable with 3,000, you can certainly use 3,000. Um, and we're going to use 2,500 for this example. So 0 0.099 times 2,500 on hours means 247 and a half watts saved. All right, 247 and a half kilowatts saved. How much does, is that savings? In terms of dollars, you simply multiply that by your cost per kilowatt hour. And in this case, at 15 cents a kilowatt hour, just using an average, you know, a high national average, what we're going to see here is a $37.13 annual savings over the least consumptive, or over the, I'm sorry, over the least efficient circulator in that category. So it saves $37.13 annually. Now all you have to do is say, here's the cost of this, here's the cost of that. How long before I offset that increased purchase price? All right, knowing that independently speaking, we're talking $37.13. Now, that gives us a pretty quick offset. All right, so say we're talking about comparing that circulator to the Taco 0015, the Grunfuss 1558, your standard three-speed circulators. Those cost about 100 bucks to buy. Uh, if you look at the Taco 0015 E3, pull the purchase price off, uh, you know, off of something online, you see maybe around 147 bucks. What you're what you're going to see now is an offset in less than one and a half heating seasons. Not bad. It's an offset in less than one and a half heating seasons. Um, my guess is that if you were in a in a someone's mechanical room and you were replacing a dead circulator and you went through this math and you showed them the difference 
they would look at it and say, huh, how much to replace all the others if you had other circulators on there? Chances are that that's going to happen more often than you think. As we start to see people, you know, if they say, okay, I'm going to save this amount of money every year and I'm, I'm spending all this, that's, that's not bad. That's not bad. So again, we want to be able to demonstrate the value of the, uh, of the upgrade, of the improvement. All right. Any questions out there, Dave? Uh, there was just one question that came in. I believe you covered it. It was asking about does the baseline change over time? So from from uh, from AGI. Oh, okay. Uh, the baseline would change over time based on circulator technology, right? Based on circulator technology. Again, what's the least efficient model available or the industry standard that's available at this time? That's what you would compare it to. What will change over time is the high end. I think right now, based on today's technology, um, you know, the the theoretical maximum I think is 212, but nobody has technology that'll reach that. The highest uh, ERs you're going to see uh, today are 187 to 188, and only six circulators uh, are in the 187 to 188 range. In fact, there are only six circulators, I believe, that cracked 180. Okay, and we'll show you those in a in a, in a few seconds. But yeah, that's the, the baseline's going to stay the same for now. What I guess the 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 other end of that, which is a really good question, David, is um, at what point, you know, when is the DOE going to say, hey, no more permanent split capacitor, everything has to be high efficiency? And that's a really good question. We don't know. We're look, you know, uh, as an educated estimation, 2026 might be the earliest that we might see something like that, uh, 20 or, or later than that, 2026. 2026 is probably the earliest we'll see it, uh, but don't, I wouldn't bet the ranch on it being 2026. You never know what's going to happen. Um, so what the Hydraulic Institute wants to do is kind of come up with a come up with a process to kind of push the uh, push a market driven change into place, and hence hence we have hence we have the ratings, so we can demonstrate the value. And let me let me know if that helps answer your question there, David. Or uh, as is my want, I probably answered more question than you asked. <laughs> <laughs> would would that be would that be a fair statement, Dave? Yes. Yep. Yes. I have. A, you, I have a real. You, you elaborated eloquently. Yes. Eloquently and effusively and and endlessly. <laughs> 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 All righty. Very good. Um, there's a differentiation I want to share with you between delta P ECM variable speed circulators and delta T ECM variable speed circulators. They operate differently, right? Delta P works on pressure differential. It tries to maintain a specific pressure differential within a system as zone valves open and close. That's what it does, and that's how it varies its speed. Uh, and it will only vary its speed in a zone valve application. In a zone pumping application, a delta P pump won't vary its speed, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't use it. That means you should program it properly. You got to know what you're doing when you're programming it to get to get it to the right and most efficient and most effective setting. Okay, because because if you can if you can set this thing up so you can heat the house with 17 watts instead of 85, hey, good. That's a good day. Okay, that's a good day's work right there. But you got to know how they how they operate. Delta T, on the other hand, will vary its speed to maintain a specific delta t or temperature difference within the system it comes with two sensors you strap one on the supply one on the return they monitor the temperature of what's going out and the temperature of what's coming back and all it's trying to do is maintain a specific difference between the two it doesn't care what the temperature is it doesn't care what the boiler's doing it doesn't interfere with outdoor reset doesn't care it's just trying to maintain a specific difference between what's going out and what's coming back the designed for system delta t so if a system was designed around a 20 degree delta T, what's the harm in giving it a 20 degree delta T? In fact, there's a lot of advantages to giving it a 20 degree delta T for as much of the heating season as you can. So as zone valves open and close, this, the circulator will speed up and slow down to try to maintain that 20 degree uh, temperature differential. But also when used as a zone pump, when, when a zone pump, when used as a zone pump, it will vary its speed as well based on how cold it is outside, which is kind of cool. It doesn't have an outdoor sensor or anything like that. What it's doing is it's inferring the load based on the return water temperature. Let's say we're let's let's say it's pumping at a certain speed and it's 10 degrees outside and it's pumping at a certain speed and it's maintaining a 20 degree delta T. 
for giggles and grins, let's say, bam, we got an instantaneous 10 degree drop in outdoor temperature. Now it's zero degrees. What's happened to the heat load when we go from 10 above to zero? Well, the heat load's going to increase. It has to because we've changed the delta T between indoors and outdoors, right? So the, the heat loss is going to increase in that room or the heat that is lost will increase in that, in that, in that zone. What the circulate the circulate is gonna gonna recognize that not by knowing what the outdoor air temperature is, but by but by the return water temperature starting to get cooler because we're trying to yank more BTUs out of that water. The the the, the return water temperature is going to get a little cooler, so the circulator is going to start to go a little bit faster. Okay, and it'll do that based on how cold it is outside as well as based on zones opening and closing, which is again kind of cool. Um, what the Department of Energy, the Department of Energy has actually studied this, uh, and what the Department of Energy has determined is not only setting aside the uh, the tremendous benefits in overall system-wide efficiency, the Department of Energy has determined that Delta T offers the greatest potential for electrical efficiency in circulators. All right, so it's not just that it makes the system work better, which it does, it also has been proven Again, by the Department of Energy, that this is the most electrically efficient way to run a circulator. Question came in from Nicholas uh, Lovell. What's the minimum delta T that the circulator can maintain? Uh, the, the delta T is adjustable between 5 and 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and the default is 20. It comes out of the box uh, defaulted at a 20 degree delta T. The thing is to make sure you set the, the, del the delta T up for whatever the system has been designed for. Residential radiant, for an example, might be designed to a 10 degree delta T. You'd want to set it up for a 10 degree delta T. Is that right? Very good, very good. So again, as we said, delta T also improves overall system performance, always tries to bring the lowest potential water temperature back to the boiler so the boiler can run a little bit longer. All right, so we, we when it does fire, it'll fire for a longer period of time. We want to impact the short cycling. Additionally, in a ModCon boiler, if we bring back the lowest possible water temperature back to the boiler, that's only a good thing for the boiler, right? That's only a good thing for the boiler. Of course, you're going to have to make sure you size your boiler circulator properly, as well as your system circulator, the Delta T pump. So both of those will uh, impact its operation. And understand that the Delta T pump does have a minimum speed. It's a nine, minimum nine watt circulator. It can't go slower than minimum. So at some point, you're not gonna have a Delta T pump at some point over the course of a heating season, you're gonna have a fixed speed circulator running at nine watts. And if your, require, your heating requirement falls below that, well, you won't have a 20 degree Delta T, but the point is at that point, you won't have a four degree Delta T either. So it's, there is that minimum speed that's important to recognize. Now, qualifying Delta T performance, there's a lot of math here and I don't wanna get really crazy into it, okay? But the Department of Energy's Appliance Standards and Rulemaking Federal Advisory Committee, known as ASRAC, okay, they have uh, they've looked at all these things in their 2016 report. Uh, they have ratings for uh, variable speed ECM motors using proportional pressure, okay, uh, as as its most efficient operating mode. That's proportional pressure is actually slightly more efficient than constant pressure. It's just proportional pressure isn't really applicable to zone valve applications. Um, what they found is, you know, those are they they give them an energy efficiency level of a 2.5 to 3. Now, uh, when you talk about ECM circulators, all right, ECM circulators, okay, there's your proportional pressure, right? ECM circulators have a 3.5 to 4 efficiency level, all right. So that's a variable speed that's a variable speed motor uh, with temperature temperature differential, so two different uh, best efficiency points. There it's a, that has an efficiency level of 3.5 to 4. So this is the Department of Energy saying, if you want real analysis on what the numbers and, and, and what that NWTW means, I can't help you there. But in the big picture, what this determined, what this says is the Department of Energy has determined that delta T differential temperature control is the best and most efficient way to run a variable speed circulator. In terms of Big numbers, all right. Over the course of a of a of a circulator's lifetime, what that's saying is a level four can can save up to twenty percent, has a twenty percent higher lifetime savings than a level three, which is substantial. Okay, it is substantial. 
Um, and they talk about quadril. They talk about quads here. And I talk about quads of energy saved. Um, if we uh, to spare you the math, all this means is um, if we all switch to delta T instead of delta P, um, we would save the equivalent of one billion seven hundred and sixty one million five hundred and forty thousand gallons of gas. Okay, that's just to put it into perspective for you. That's the lifetime saving. So, just an interesting an interesting uh, way of looking at at the two technologies. People like Delta P for two reasons. The first is it's less expensive than Delta T. You all recognize that. It's less expensive than Delta T. That's number one. And number two is there are no sensors. Some people just simply don't want to bother with sensors. If that has sensors, I don't want to do it. I'm not touching sensors. I don't install sensors. I don't like sensors. I'm afraid of sensors. You name it. They don't put in sensors. Okay. You don't like sensors. Uh, and and you know you want to go for something less expensive. A Delta P pumps a very very good circulator, and as you saw, based on the uh, efficiency ratings, it can save a it can save a considerable amount of money. If you want to also save that considerable amount of money on your electric bill, but also get the system to work a little bit better and a little bit more efficiently, and and take a bite out of potential short cycling, Delta T is a is a very very good uh, very logical leap to make in terms of uh, of improving how a system works. As an example, again, he, just the numbers. Okay, here's just the numbers. Uh, if we if we were to math all that out, um, over the baseline pump, we're looking at uh, saving about forty dollars and fifty cents over the course of a heating season. All right. Uh, again, if you look online, you'll find a price in that range for a VT2218. So your offset based on electrical consumption only, electrical consumption only, is going to be less than four heating seasons. All right, three and a half heating seasons, less than four heating seasons, somewhere in there. And that's just the electrical savings. We're not even going to discuss the difference between, you know, the difference in how it, how efficiently it will help the system operate by reducing short cycling and bringing back the lowest possible water temperature to either a condensing or non-condensing boiler. So again, just some numbers for you to consider, some numbers for you to look at. Is that right? Now, where are you gonna find this product labeling? It'll be on the box, obviously, as shown here. And on the underside, under panel of, of, uh, of our circulators, as, uh, as shown here. So if you look at the circulator, you won't be able to see it. You'll actually have to turn it upside down and take a look at it, okay? Uh, so it's gonna be right underneath there where my, my cursor is. And that's where you'll see the, the, the label on the circulator itself. And it'll be a smaller one. It's just gonna give you the energy rating. Uh, it'll give you the, the weight, the CEI the energy rating and that range, okay? It won't give you the math part of it. That'll be on the box. Now, I now, just want to point out for everybody, JV, that the, yes, the labeling is also optional at this point. So um, by manufacturers, they don't need that, to necessarily have the labeling on the circulator itself or on the box even. Um, so I just wanted to point that out for everybody. If you go to, if you go to look for it, you may not find it. Uh, it may be listed somewhere in their literature or someplace online. Um, but we'll also show you another place uh, in a little bit on where you can actually find them online, not necessarily at a manufacturer's, but at the HI website. So Right, right. We, we, As you can see, there's a reason why we chose to put ours on there is because um, I said that there were, the, the high, the, there were six circulators that were in the 187 to 188 range in terms of efficiency ratings. Uh, 187 to 188, which were by far the highest. There were six circulators, 187 to 188. Taco had five of them. Okay, Taco had five of them, which is why we were more than ready to put the, these labels on there. We had five of them. Armstrong was the other one. The Armstrong Compass was the, was also rated at 187 to 188. So again, it's for our circulators, the first you'll see is the 0018E, which is our multi-feature, multi-function circulator with Bluetooth connectivity. Uh, its rating was 152 to 188. The VT2218, our Delta T pump, 138 to 188. Uh, the 007E, which might be our single biggest seller, single setting, no math, no no dials, no no decisions to make here. It's just the ECM version of the 007. That was a 168 to 187 uh, uh, range, simply because it only works on 10 foot ahead constant pressure. Yeah, the 0015E3 went up to 188 because that can work at five foot ahead constant pressure, which is one lower. Uh, so that works at five foot ahead constant pressure, 10 foot ahead constant pressure, or full speed fixed speed. 
So those are the those are the differences between the 70 and the 15 the 15 E3. And again, those were all rated at 1, uh, 188, the 007 at 187. Uh, also, we have the fifth circulator is the VR1816, which is also rated up to 188. And the, VR, the, the VR1816 is, uh, it's, it's the 0018E without Bluetooth, all right? If you just don't want to mess with Bluetooth, you have the VR1816. Otherwise, it's essentially the same circulator. And I wanted to put the 006E3 in there as well. It is a domestic hot water recirculation pump, uh, and that is uh, that is ECM, and that has a, an a, an energy rating of 162 to 174. And of all of the domestic hot water specific circulators tested, that one was by far the highest and had the highest energy rating, the most efficient. All right. So, of the heating circulators that we were, that that we're looking at again, the five highest or the six highest were our our five plus the uh, uh, plus the uh, Armstrong Compass, nobody else cracked the 180 barrier. Nobody uh, that we could see, nobody else cracked the 180 barrier in terms of in terms of uh, of energy efficiency and energy rating. So as Dave said, there is a place for you to look all this stuff up yourself. All right, and that's this website. It is er.pump.org. Er.pump.org, and that will take you to uh, the Hydraulic Institute's uh, energy rating page for circulators and for commercial pumps. When you go there, you can you can look up commercial pumps or circulating pumps, and circulating pumps are the residential ones. That's the one you want to look at, and you can look up based on uh, a member uh, member company, you know, manufacturer, and uh, you'll be able to see all of the circulators that they have uh, that that have been listed by that that company, and all the different ratings and the the information behind it so it's a great resource to see who's who's got the best technology basically and who's who has the greatest overall levels of energy efficiency so er.pump.org is where you're going to go to find that information all righty that was a quick one that was a quick take go tuesday so what i want to do now is just kind of open it up to any questions that you all might have all right what kind of questions might you have? So we can, uh, uh, now this is as good a time as any to ask them. All righty, got all that stuff up here. Okay, very good. I did share out the link with everybody, okay. went right to the circulator section if they wanted to take a look at the just the circ side of things, so. Um, and Eric was mentioning that we may have a typo on that page, John. Oh, it's er.pumps.org. My bad. Sorry. My bad. Let me if I'm gonna fix that right now. <laughs> er.pumps. There we go. Thank you for that. I apologize for having that incorrect. Er.pumps.org. Does pump efficiency decrease over time due to wear or other factors? Not that we've seen, Adam. Um, really, it's 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 a little piece of electronics, right? Um, there's not a whole lot to wear out. They don't, you know, the electronics don't won't wear out. Um, uh, Dave, do you have a do you have a take on that? Again, not that we have seen. Not not in small residential. Uh, are we yeah. going to see that? Because the 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 really the only thing that's going to wear is going to be our bearings, uh, and the bearings aren't traditional bearings that we see in our larger pumps. So we've just got a uh, it's going to be a ceramic shaft uh, that the impeller is on that the uh, rotor is in. Uh, sitting into a graphite sleeve. So there's not going to be a lot of wear. If we do see a lot of wear, we've also got a circulator that's getting really loud. Um, and if it's getting really loud, that means we probably have some water quality issues and probably need to change that circulator because we may have uh, scored or, or damaged those bearings. So, uh, but deficiency uh, or efficiency decrease over time, yeah, there's not, there's not a lot of wear that's gonna happen here. No, not no, not a little wet rotor circulator. Certainly not. Uh, David Bear asks, you mentioned Delta P is less expensive than Delta T. Can you elaborate? Yes, it costs less. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm I'm just kidding. So in it, one way, you like to go way over and elaborate, and and then yeah, you know, another way, you just cut to the chase. Yeah, yeah. it's Two a less expensive circulator. It's, it's, it's technology wise, the technology is is less expensive. 
um, the manufacturing is less expensive and simpler. Uh, that's that's really the, the the biggest difference. You want a, 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 like the Takeo 0015 E3, like we said, it might, it might cost you 140, 150 bucks, maybe thereabouts to buy, uh, whereas the Delta T circulator might cost you 250 bucks to buy. Right. So it's and not one a of the, big yeah. difference in price. You know, it's 100 bucks. It's 100 bucks isn't going to break anybody, but that is the that is the difference in price. Uh, the big difference in the uh, circulator itself is also the manufacturing because with the VT2218, we do have a uh, a visible screen. Right. Um, so you can see what's going on uh, live time when the circulator is up and running. So there are, you know, the, the VT was one of those first circulators that we had uh, that we started manufacturing and uh, left that, so to speak, screen on there. And those costs are, are still in there too. Yeah. So, so and then we came along, you know, as we saw, the, the VT2218 as, a, as the first ECM circulator we manufactured, then, you know, we listened to a lot of the customers out there and they said, yeah, it's a great circulator, but, you know, and the price range compared to what we're used to buying right now, um, they found it was a hard pill to swallow. Uh, and this is going back 10 years ago already uh, that we've yep. had the VT pump out there. And uh, so then we came out with the Delta P design, which eliminated the screen and, and things like that. So it's not just the sensors, but it's also a lot more manufacturing uh, that went into the difference between the two circulators. And uh, David's follow-up says, yes, it is physically a different circulator. Yes, it is. Uh, it's, it's, lar it's a little longer, okay? It's a little heavier. And it has a, bit, it has a good size uh, LCD screen on there. So you can, when you program it, you can actually see in plain English what you're programming. Um, so you know, what the, you, know what, you know what the setting it is in, it's Delta T or one of the other op, operating modes that you can do. It's a, you can do, set it up as a four speed fixed speed circulator. So, you know, it'll have four speeds instead of three, which is nice. Uh, or it can be set up as a set point circulator if you wanted it to simply vary its speed to maintain a specific set point in something. And it can be also with a manual switch over, it can be set up to do chilled water if you wanted it to do that way for, for cooling. Uh, so so there's a lot there's a lot in there. Uh, and the LCD screen is nice because you can pr you can program, uh, you can see what the Delta T is programmed to. And because we have sensors on the supply and return, we see what the actual temperature going out and the temperature coming back is right on the circulator, which makes a nice diagnostic tool. And the other thing about Delta T is it is about as close as we have. I'm not going to say it absolutely is, but it's as close as we have to a self-sizing circulator. Uh, we have to work, be within that green wedge, that green operating wedge on the pump curve. But if you set it up for like a 10 degree delta T and the system's going to fall within there, it, the circulator will, in fact, get pretty darn close to sizing itself. If you have a really small zone, OK, it's not going to it's not going to size itself. A really small zone, what it's going to do is it's if the flow and head requirements are below minimum speed, it's going to run minimum speed and it's never going to vary its speed. But it'll be a nine watt fixed speed pump, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. What is Excellent. the life? This is from Tossie. What's the life expectancy for IFC versus older CI checks? Higher water temperatures always used. No one trusts lowering water temps. Any future concerns? This seems like three questions in there. Yeah. Well, the 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 IFCs and the circulators themselves, whether it's going to be an ECM or standard efficiency circulator itself, um, are rated for at least 250 degrees at 150 psi. Uh, for our plastic inserted IFC check valves. Yes, the cast iron ones are, hey, it's all metal, right? Um, uh, as you see out there. Um, so I'm seeing same life expectancy between one versus the other. Yeah. Um, obviously with your cast iron check valves, you've got to ha handle that higher pressure drop that's going to occur and, and account for that when circulator sizing, um, which I think we've shown in, in previous Taco Tuesday classes. Mm -hmm. Um, and what the pressure drop of a flow check is going to be, but life expectancy should be there. I mean, yes, um, I, I think as we start seeing the design towards lower temperatures, obviously materials can change in the future as we start migrating away from always having to do 180 degrees always to every residential system out there. Uh, so, you know, material designs can change if we were to, you know, see the up, you know, 180 disappear altogether. Yeah, that'll be a while. That'll be you and I'll be along retired. I mean, by the time yes, that happens, correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so will you, Anthony. <laughs> Probably, I would. I don't know, man. I think Anthony might live forever. He's, he keeps himself in good shape, not like us. <laughs> Alrighty. Uh, other questions, folks? Please share.
Um, was this useful information? You know, the Hydraulics Institute, this is big, this is a big deal. This is a big deal because it gives you the tools that you will need to show your customer, hey, this is what's coming, or this is where the industry's heading. Uh, if your customer balks, you can show them the quote unquote offset in terms of, hey, in, in two years, you know, you'll uh, this thing will have saved enough energy and enough money to have completely wiped out whatever additional price you've paid for it to buy this. And then you're gonna enjoy that savings forever and ever and ever for as long as that circulator shall live. Uh, that's why I tend to think a lot of people are gonna say, hey, how much, to how much to replace the other two while you're here? You know, that's a very real possibility. Uh, additionally, uh, again, what the, well, the reason, as we said, the reason the Hydraulic Institute is doing this is to uh, promote that voluntary industry shift away from permanent split capacitor towards um, you know towards ECM um, and make it a market shift as opposed to a mandated shift, which is always a better idea. Right. And what's interesting, you know, like I said before, we've been doing ECM circulators now well over 10 years. Uh, when they first came out of the box and we started talking about the, the DOE standard, like John talked about before, the date of, say, 2026 possibly coming along. Well, going back 10 years ago, we started having this conversation. And we kept on saying it was going to be around 2020, all right, uh, 2021. And that went, you know, went right by it. Obviously, we've been a little busy the last couple of years figuring out other stuff. Uh, <laughs> and um, the conversation when we would... Uh, some people would look at it and say, well, yeah, the circulator, you know, it's got some nice features in there that I would like to see, but I'm not going to worry about it until then because of that higher price cost, right? You know, what am I getting for it? And, you know, if you look at a lot of the brochures, it'll say up to 85% electrical savings. All right. What does that mean? Right. Yeah. And that's where this all of a sudden changes the story. And it says, and it wasn't just on some manufacturer's piece of literature saying, this is what you can get out of it, you know. Now you got somebody else saying, this is what you can get, all right? And here's all the reasons why. Um, so I think that's some of the biggest uh, things that we're going to see out of it. And, you know, since, uh, you know, yes, everything takes a little bit of time to accept and, and to start using in regular systems out there, but we've been seeing steady, steady, steady increases uh, and in acceptance in ECM out there. Uh, for mm -hmm. a lot of job sites. So in the beginning, it was kind of scary and it was kind of cool and, you know, let me find the right job for it. Now it's, you know, let's just go ahead and, and put them in everywhere. Uh, and the acceptance has grown. There's still a lot of people holding out, so, so to speak, waiting for that date to switch over and say, all right, well, then I'll look at it then. Um, but I think those numbers are starting to drop because now there's real valid data behind it. Right. And it's, it, and Dave mentioned that, you know, the, re, the, the, brochure says saves up to 85% electricity. Listen, this wouldn't be the first time a manufacturer has tried to scenario you rosily, okay? Uh, <laughs> so that that's just that's just the way it is. But this is these aren't these aren't our numbers, these aren't Grunfoss's numbers, these aren't B&G's numbers, these aren't Armstrong's numbers. This is the Hydraulic Institute. It's all done by independent testing, third-party verified independent test labs that this is what they came up with. All right, this is the these are the results of an independent test. And you win, you win, you come in second, you come in second, you come in third, you come in third. That's just the way it is. But the important part here is knowing how to use the formula to say, hey, listen, I know a lot of times it might be just to convince ourselves too. Uh, you know, the, the homeowner, does he really care that this is 50 bucks more, or 60 bucks more, or however much more than the other? Does it does it does it enter into does it really show up on their radar? We tend to believe it does. It happens, I think, a lot less than than we than we believe it to happen. Uh, but in the case where, hey, what you know, if you give them the you, if you give them the choice, I can replace it with this circulator or this circulator, and they're going to ask, well, what's the difference? You can show them math, math, you know, independent third party math that can't really be questioned. So that's the that's the way we want to look at it, and that gives them a, that gives them the that gives the market the ability to make the decision that's best for them. Somebody may say, hey, I don't care. I just want the cheap one. Great. I'm happy to put it in. Let's get it on. Or they might say, huh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I want that. In fact, change the other two while you're here. You know, it's, you, you're going to get, it's going. those are the two extremes. You might be somewhere in the middle. It's just the way to go. Bill says, uh, still loving all the sets of golf clubs. I'm wondering, <laughs> oh, are you talking about behind me? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> 
I have a problem, Bill. I, I, I have to admit it. I, I have a problem. I'm, I, <laughs> the I'm, first I, step I, is admitting, JB. I Yeah, I admit I have a problem. I'm not going to do a darn thing about it, but I will admit I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, ca I counted them up the other day. Seven sets of irons. <laughs> Seven sets. Yeah, yep. And only one is with made only within... One only one's been made within the last 12 years. Just so you know. Okay. Everything else is, I got some, I got five sets of old Hogan's and two sets of old McGregor's, but um, that's not what we're here to talk about. Right. <laughs> Just want to make sure Bill felt at home. All right, Bill's jealous. Oh, you don't know the half of it, Bill. If you knew more, you'd hate me. <laughs> A lot of people do anyway. All right. Um, but yeah, I think when we're talking about, uh, about, you know, using this information, it really is to 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 help the market drive the change, and that's uh, in any in in any solution, anything. That's always better than mandates, but the mandates are going to come. I mean, that's just a matter of when. Uh, but again, you, how you use it is going to be entirely up to you. But uh, again, it shows dollars and cents what the difference is in operating costs strictly upon electricity. Now, in Takeo after dark and, and in past Takeo Tuesdays. We've gone into in depth on how overall ECM can help that system work better and more closely to where it's supposed to in turn and, and help the overall system work more efficiently and work more effectively. That, ladies and gentlemen, is very hard to put a number on. It's common sense, it's logic, but the math is very fuzzy. All right. This is something where the math is not fuzzy and it breaks it down into simple dollars and cents. We do know short cycling is, is a killer of overall efficiency. We do know that if we don't bring the lowest possible water temperature back to a boiler, it's not going to operate as efficiently. We may get a sexy number when we do a combustion analysis, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what it's running at all winter long, right? If we bring the lowest possible water temperature back, we know it's going to be at its, at the, as most, at, at its peak efficiency, as, efficient, as efficiently, it's gonna operate as efficiently as it possibly can. Um, if we don't do that, if we just slap a circulator on there, three-speed circulator, set it to contractor, no callback mode, because we don't know where to set it, I'm over pumping like crazy. And when I'm over pumping like crazy, the return water temperature going back to the boiler is higher than it should be. When the return water temperature going back to the boiler is higher than it should be, the water temperature going into the boiler is higher than it should be. When that happens, the delta T shrinks, the boiler short cycles, and the overall efficiency is not what it could be or should be. We know that. I have yet to see the math that can help us express that simply and understandably. So that's all anecdotal and, you know, you've got to infer and, and logically consider that um, in terms of, we, but we know that's going to help the city. We know doing that part right is going to help make the system work more efficiently. This, it's electricity, it's run hours, it's numbers, it's pretty straightforward black and white. So cool. Excellent. Alrighty, folks. What other questions do you have? This is a this is a good opportunity for you to to chime in. We've got 79 of you out there still, so uh, I'm sure someone must have a question out there that we can answer that has nothing to do with golf clubs. Although, thank you for bringing that up, Bill. <laughs> um, and then let's see, right back here, you'll see my picture of Ben Hogan at Firestone. All right, and there's Tiger Woods, John Daly. And somewhere around there is Ernie Els. Right there, yeah, right there's Ernie Els. Just my own little Hall of Fame. <laughs> is that right? Any more questions, folks? Give you one last shot. Let's hear from you. Love to hear from you. Unless you just want to sit there and listen, listen to me and Dave vamp for a while, which we're also very good at. Well, hey, listen, uh, Takeo After Dark tonight at 9 p.m., if you go to the Takeo website, uh, we'll be talking about variable speed circulators and the real benefit of them. A lot of the discussion we just have, we're going to jump into in depth tonight. Uh, and then tomorrow night is going to be the finale of our spring season, uh, Takeo After Dark spring season. What's the topic, Dave, tomorrow night? Tomorrow night is pumping and piping for modulating condensing boilers. Ooh, and we're going to be talking about things like buffer tanks. Yeah, and choose the right circulator and the right application. Yes. Very good. Very good. We'll head over to the Takeo website, uh, look under the training tab, and you can sign up for both tonight 
and tomorrow night if you wish and then tomorrow night session will also be repeated next tuesday night at 9 p.m so we would love to have you uh love to have you out here so uh, oh we got uh oh, the takeover up in vegas we'll take you golfing out here after september yes after september would be a good time to go golfing <laughs> in las vegas <laughs> i have i have played golf in phoenix in august it was 106 degrees and as long as you kept drinking stuff drinking gatorade it was doable i'm not <laughs> sure i'd want to do it again but it was doable so bill all over that man yes we will absolutely uh come out and do that you won't you won't have to ask twice <laughs> all righty hey folks thank you so much for being with us uh we really do appreciate the gift of your time each and every tuesday i hope this was useful to you uh, feel free to send us some feedback, uh, some emails, what you what you liked, what you what, what you would have liked to have seen, uh, and if this was useful, we'd love to hear that too. We like love to hear the good stuff, so please please with that. If you got some other suggestions, we'll take those too because that's how we get better. So again, thank you so much for the gift of your time, uh, Dave. Always good to see you. This is twice you in one well. day for me to twice in one day for me to see Dave online, so that's cool. Uh, and I think we got a third one coming up in just a few minutes, but that one's private. So, hey, guys, yep. thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the week. Get out there and enjoy the good weather, and we'll see you down the road. See you all. Take care, everybody.